I want to give a small intro about you, ma'am. Shall okay. I, ma'am? Uh, all right, all right. Please go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Few seconds, ma'am. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, special uh, speaker of plenary session three, Dr. Chitra Ma'am. Uh, Chitra Ma'am is uh, an assistant professor in English at uh, Shabazz College, Royal University of Bhutan. Prior to it, she served, she served in the uh, extended campus of Shabazz College, and her assignment was with master's program in English to supervise the research scholars and serve as a program leader for academics and research. She holds two decades of territory teaching experience. Her service record includes teaching expertise in English literature and language, along with curriculum design and course development. Her areas of exploitation include cultural studies, culture studies, contemporary literature, post-colonial liter studies, European literature, women's and gender studies, with avid interest to embrace the emer emerging areas in humanities. She has completed the following funded research projects. The first one titled A Study on English Language Proficiency Level of the Students of Subhast College and Resource Requirement for the Proposed Learning Center. Com uh, she has, yes, it was completed under Faculty and Student Research Enhancement Project funded by Government of India. Project tied assistance followed by a study of factors affecting faculty attrition and turnover intention at Sabast College by the research team. The collaborative project with St. Joseph's College, Darjeeling on collection, transliteration, analysis, and publication of folklore from Eastern Bhutan has been a another milestone work on her work of her. The following are some of her meritorious academic achievements. She has conducted conducted storytelling sessions as an initiative to promote folk traditions among the adolescents and to preserve the folk tales has directed the Shakespearean tragedy Macbeth and her team won the first prize and cash award including the best actor and actress awards in the annual drama competition event the visual celebration held under Sabah theater in Zambal. Guided students for the competitions organized by Indian Embassy in 2016 and in 2017. Students team secured third position in the debate on education among RUB students and the first and second positions in the book reviews. Served as one of the judges for Bhutan's intra Dosgong uh, school theater competition held at uh, Bemagastal from 10th, 11th June 2017. In terms of research, Chitramam has secured second position in the first rep project, REP project presentation was awarded with cash prize. The best dissertation certificate was awarded to her scholar for the master's dissertation title, juxtaposition of sexual and ethnic crisis in Sidham Selvadurai's funny boy. She is also an IELTS trainer and had completed the teaching knowledge test certified by the University of Cambridge. She has edited the following book, Researching New Heights Through Policy Research and Practice, along with a team from the Department of Research and External Relations Office of the Vice Chancellor, Royal University of Bhutan. And she's Co-editing a book on ecocentric literature, uh, writing for Green World to be released in December 20, released in 2022. She has published over 50 plus research articles in book chapters, journals, conference volumes, and presented papers in 60 plus international and national conferences. She had been the overseas examiner for doctoral thesis, member in board of studies for syllabus validation and the editorial board of international journals. Her active engagement in international conferences in the capacity of keynote speaker and also serves as a resource person for online academic workshop, workshops and webinars, what not. Uh, actually, really, we had a great person, eminent personality here. Uh, Dr. Chitra, ma'am, uh, a warm welcome on behalf of our AVB College Management, Cape Pomeran Trust, our department faculty members and all the 
presenters i welcome you once again um, now the session is over to you ma'am oh thank you so much ma'am uh, sorry if i have disrupted the schedule because i didn't receive any communication uh, from the concern okay ma'am actually our participants presenters and even chapters and ma'am is readily uh, eagerly waiting for your waiting for your uh, speech ma'am okay thank you so much uh, ma'am ma before i begin i would like to know how much time do i have ma'am you have given 30 minutes ma'am okay uh, yes, you can please mind the time and i will try to cut short some of my presentation yes ma'am have... yes ma'am yes, ma uh, so if it exceeds the time before 5 minutes you can just remind me so i can do yes, the need accordingly uh, so yes, that i will be eating the chunk of time of the presenters during the technical session who are awaiting no uh, problem you can carry on ma'am <laughs> thank you uh, thank you ma'am could you see the screen I yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, ma yes, ma yes. Okay. So now, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It is visible. All right. Because I could not see the other screen. I could see only this. That's the difficulty no for your voice is very clear and your uh, screen also visible, ma'am. No problem. Okay. Uh, so with this uh, warm introduction by madam i would like to go ahead uh, thank you for inviting me to this international virtual conference i am really very glad that the ap college avp college of arts and science is conducting the virtual conference because nowadays people want to do hybrid but still you have given the opportunity for me to join this conference virtually that's uh, something great which i would like to congratulate the team for coming up with this idea and organizing it even in the new normal thank you ma'am yes and also to uh, cape comorin trust and i have been introduced to this intellectual gathering by dr bharati srinivasan uh, she had been the uh, intermediary person i should say Uh, who sent this brochure and who had been connecting me with the organizers and there was little communication gap that happened due to this but i owe my gratitude and thanks to dr bharati srinivasan at this juncture okay after going through the brochure on subaltern studies i thought Uh, okay most of the presentations will be on short stories i happen to listen to two of the presenters uh, who did in the last technical session it will be mostly on uh, short stories or it would be on uh, fiction fictional characters and dalit literature dalit feminism these might be the topics i also considered about dalit literature uh, then i ended up in this topic because i want to offer something new a new insight as he a take away from my session during this conference so this made me come up with this topic rehearsal of revolution theatrical forms of the oppressed i have been reading the book theater of the oppressed by augusto boyel and even many of the african playwrights have borrowed their ideas from augusto boyle who is a brazilian theater director and this has influenced me too when i read some of the community plays of tiango yugi wa tiango a kenyan playwright he has been highly influenced by augusto boyle's interactive theater who has experimented with different forms of theater this made me choose this topic because it has educational value and these theatrical forms are part of the educational uh, psychology and it is part of the curriculum in some of the countries and it is staged in the socio cultural centers as well as in the educational institutions as the arsenal part of theater that made me choose this topic thinking it would be more appropriate for our audience theatrical forms of the oppressed here how theater deals with the oppressed and how theater communicates 
to the oppressed by empowering them to make a new kind of revolution and to liberate themselves from the chains of suffering. It is not expecting anybody to uh, voice their concerns or anybody to play the role for them, whereas people, the mass, the oppressed, they themselves can become part of the action in transforming their own lives by taking charge of the means of production in theater. This is the idea behind it in nutshell, which I would be elaborating during this presentation. To introduce the concept, first let me begin with a question. We are all students of literature and having been studying poetry and drama, we have studied that the object of poetry and drama is to instruct and delight. So what is the purpose of art? Should art educate, inform, organize, or should it influence, incite to action, or simply be an object of pleasure? As I said, poetry and drama as a medium only to delight and instruct. So what is the role of theater here? We have studied about theater that the essential ingredients of drama are there should be a setting for a place of action and characters. Here it is the presentation of fictional persons informed by, interpreted by performers and the use of dialogue. But conventionally, in conventional stage, the dialogue is always between the characters. Whereas the Brazilian theater director, Augusto Boyle, developed the theater of the oppressed. I would be using the abbreviation TO. During the 1950s and 60s, he developed this theater and called it as the theater of the, uh, theater of the oppressed with the mission to transform the monologue of traditional performances into a dialogue. Here, by monologue, he says only the characters on stage are speaking among themselves. But then he wanted to transform the monologue into dialogue. And here, the dialogue should be between audience and stage. Keeping this in mind, Boyle experimented with many kinds of interactive theater, such as image theater, forum theater, invisible theater, newspaper theater, etc. He It goes on and on, believing that dialogue is the dynamic of human beings. And all human beings desire to have dialogue and we are capable of it. So why not we have dialogue in our communication? And his interpretation is that when a dialogue becomes a monologue, oppression begins there, oppression ensues. That's the reason he wanted to practice a theater that is not relying on monologue, but that very much depends on dialogue because he is trying to break the chain of oppression through this dialogue. And this made him consider theater itself as a language, as well as an efficient weapon of liberation in the hands of the people, that is the mass. It is not in the hands of a few actors or the state theater companies. He is not depending on the theatrical groups, mainly organized by the aristocrats and the ruling classes. He wanted theater to be in the hands of the mass. Therefore, he strongly objected the efforts of the ruling class that has taken permanent hold on the theater and utilizing it as a tool for domination. To end this conventional practice, he felt the need to change the very concept of what theater is. This is his idea. This is his concept, quote unquote. While some people make theater, we all are theater. So this is his idea of theater. And with this concept, he gave rise to popular theater. And it is also known as people's theater. Every theater is performed for the people, but he also considers that it should be performed by the people. That is to say, it should be produced by the people and no longer by the bourgeois, the class which has been historically in possession of the cultural institutions. And further, he wanted to make theater a weapon for liberation in the hands of the masses. And he also felt here, 
the need to create appropriate theatrical forms. And as a result, change in theater became imperative for him. And to talk about the story of coercive indoctrination, here I would like to take you through a brief history of theater in nutshell. Okay, history means not uh, uh, pages and pages. Briefly, I would just mention a few points to uh, uh, inform the audience how coercive indoctrination began with theater in the uh, conventional forms. In the beginning, we know that theater was the dithyrambic song. When we study about Aristotle's poetics, it is the dithyrambic song. Dithyrambic song of, of Greek theater means free people singing in the open air in the form of carnival, in the form of feast. Later, the ruling classes took possession of the theater and they built their dividing walls by separating actors from spectators people who act and people who watch. This was the first division and that, that's all, the show is over. The spectators just watch, enjoy, they are entertained and they come back. Then secondly, among the actors, a division has been created. That is the protagonist, mainly aristocrats, were separated from the rest of the actors or the chorus symbolizing in one way or the other, the chorus symbolizes the mass. This is how the protagonist or the aristocratic actors were separated from the mass. Whereas in Boyle's, Augusto Boyle's theatrical view, and also from subaltern perspective, this is considered, this division, this creation of walls is considered to be the beginning of coercive indoctrination. Here comes the question, how to break this chain of oppression, not only breaking the chain, but the missing chain need to be completed. So how to complete the cycle? This led to a process and Boyle describes this process as experiments with the people's theater. And he conducted this experiments in Peru in 1960s and 70s with the workers of the Peruvian nationality. And here he came up with the idea that all must act, need not be the actors, the professionally trained actors. He came up with the new concept that all must act and all must be protagonist. This is the poetics of Augusto Boyle. So first he wanted to destroy the barriers created by the ruling classes in the theater, that is the barrier between the actors and the spectators. Having destroyed that, he came up with his ideology, all must act and all must be protagonist in the sense, we are all protagonist in the necessary transformations of society. And this is the process, this is the process he described as a method, and this became an experimental theater. For this, he wanted to conquest the means of theatrical production, and but this- Excuse me, excuse me ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, yes, are ma you sharing the slides, ma'am? Are you sharing the slides, ma'am? Yeah. Could you not see? Actually, you are in, no, yes, ma'am, you are in first slide, ma'am. Your slides are not shared. Okay, just a minute. Now? No, ma'am. Could you see now? Could you see the first slide, ma'am? Just a minute. Now I'm sharing the window. Could you see it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I will just move it. I'm oh, sorry. Second slide, could you see? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Shall I make it full screen or like this? Shall I make it full screen? Or better I leave it like this. Maybe full screen you are not seeing. 
now i am with uh, thanks on the tree of the theater of the oppressed is it visible yes ma'am okay uh, let me proceed then um i left with the point on boyle's uh, poetics of the oppressed okay so he was talking about the conquest of the means of theatrical production that should also come to the control of the people and this idea gave rise to the poetics of the oppressed which is also the poetics of the spectators because boyle is highly critical about the viewer's position in the theater that is the position of the spectator and often he refers to the word spectator as an obscene word in his dictionary it's a bad word okay here he contradicts highly with aristotle and in his view what is poetics in boyle's view he feels theater is change it has to change the spectators theater is not a simple presentation of what already exists it is a process of becoming and becoming is an ongoing process isn't it so he is he disagrees with the idea of being he wanted theater to be a process of becoming it is an ongoing process for him in his experimental methods and he tried to show this in practice by saying how theater can be placed at the service of the oppressed it has to serve the oppressed that's the role of the theater not just to make a presentation so that by using theater and by taking the means of production of the theater in their hands the oppressed can express themselves and theater can become a new language that can help them to discover new concepts for this the walls that separates actors and spectators need to be torn down and the main objective of the poetics of the oppressed is to change the people so change is the key word here he wanted to change the people and i told you he is against the word spectators because spectators are considered by him as passive beings in the theatrical phenomenon he wanted to change this idea by changing the spectators or changing the people from object to subject so far where the spectators who go to the theater to watch the performance are objects they are treated as objects he wanted them to become subject and he wanted them to become actors and also transformers of the dramatic action to bring a change in the society ultimately this is the role he gives to the spectator and he bring he, he also brings forward the idea of contradiction in the word spectator and uh, he divides the word by spect and actor from spectator he is making the word spect actor and this spect actor is not just an active spectator it does not mean the spectator need to be an active spectator it is not just moving from passive to active by spect actor he means a non actor becoming a protagonist not only in the theater to practice his role in the theater in the fictional space but also carry carry forward the practice into the society to bring a transformation in the society this is the meaning he loads on the word spect actor a non actor becoming a protagonist he uses it in the sense of the non actor and not in the sense of active spectator so passive active is highly um, contentious for him he is dealing with active resistance okay in what way does this boylean method differ from the pre existing theatrical theories even before boyle there were many dramatists who came up with their theories isn't it and here i am presenting only two cases in the interest of time to begin with uh, aristotle proposed a poetics and in aristotle's poetics the spectator actually delegates power to the dramatic character to act and think for the audience this is the poetics of aristotle and this aristotle's poetics gave rise to catharsis purgation of emotions for the audience but the audience gave away the power 
of acting and thinking to the actors on the stage. And if we take case two, uh, German playwright Bertolt Brecht, who is a playwright as well as here, a uh, theorist in theater, he proposes here poetics in which the spectator delegates power to the character who acts in the place of audience. The character is still an actor in place of the audience, but the spectator reserves the right to think for himself. Often, this goes in opposition to the character. In um, Brett's case, there is an awakening of critical consciousness that happens in the audience. Whereas Boyle's Poetics of the Uplist focuses on the action itself, unlike the Poetics of Aristotle and Poetics of Brett, he focuses on the action. Here, the spectator delegates no power at all to the character actor, either to think or act in his place. On the contrary, the spectator himself assumes the protagonic role, changes the dramatic action, discusses plans for change with the participants, and then tries out the solution on the stage. So in the fictional space, it, he rehearses the solution and verifies whether the solution is feasible. Is it a workable solution? In short, the spect actor participant, see the divisions. The spectator has already become spect actor, and the spect actor is consulting with the other participants so the spect actor participant trains himself. He is nothing but the common man. He trains himself for real action, actually, in the safety of the fictional space. In this case also, theater is not completely revolutionary in itself. In the sense, it is not inciting revolution, but theatrical space is surely becoming a space to rehearse. It is a rehearsal space of the revolution so thus, those ideas are getting incited and they are practiced also. So it becomes feasible for the man to put that into reality. He can practice that act in reality in the society. Here, the liberated uh, spectator as a whole launches into action. And no matter the action is fictional, what matters here is action. Let me move to the next slide. Hope you can hear it. Yes, ma'am. Now, how this transformation happens, uh, I will quickly take you through some stages, transforming the spectator into spect actor, having explained the word. This happens in Boyle's stage. Yeah? Ma'am, five more minutes, ma'am. OK. I'm well on time. Um, here, uh, it, uh, he takes us through four stages. Uh, first, it begins with body, knowing the body and making the body expressive. This is how he begins. And this results in image theater, because the belief here is the first word of the theatrical vocab is the human body. Not only in Boyle's theater, in theater in general, the first word of the theatrical vocab is human body itself because body is the source of sound and movement. When we speak, we sit and speak, be it a physical conference or online conference, we are present as the body. And we, body is communicating, it is the source. Body becomes the source of sound and movement, isn't it? Therefore, to control the means of theatrical production in that space, man must first know his own body and control his own body in order to make it more expressive. This is the idea behind it. Then a man can practice the theatrical forms and he can move from the condition of spectator to that of actor. Thereby, he ceases to be an object but becomes a subject and he is also changing from being a witness to that of your protagonist. And in the image theater, a uh, human body is used as a tool of representing feelings, ideas, and relationships. Along with that comes making the body expressive through theatrical games. Then comes the third part. And the third stage is theater itself is a language. Because one begins to practice theater as a language that is living. It is full of life and it and also it belongs to the present moment. Therefore, theater is not a space to 
display the finished product, rather it is an ongoing process. Here I would like, to, then theater is also a discourse because a lot of discussion is going on about the feasibility of the solutions. A situation is taken. I will close with one illustration. Uh, here I have taken the example of exploitation in a fish export factory. And in this factory, the workers were exploited by making them to work for 12 consecutive hours. That was uh, to combat this inhuman exploitation. Each participant came up with a proposal and they invented some uh, solutions with the native ingenuity to work as operation turtle. That means in a slow manner or to work faster so that the machine itself breaks down. He, they want to fill the machine with excessive fish. But this solution was disagreed by the group member. So they gave up another solution, the SPECT actor participant. Uh, finally, they suggested uh, to go on with a strike or to throw a bomb at the machine and to start a union. All of these solutions were discussed. They discussed about strike and realized that it is impracticable. Because with so much unemployment around, the boss would always find a replacement for the strikers. And they also abandoned the idea of bomb solution. Finally, the solution of forming a small trade union to negotiate the workers' demands as well as to politicize, because the theater is also a political space, to politicize the workers as well as the unemployed. So this solution was judged to be the best by the participants here we can see in this is an example from forum theater where theater works as a language and as a discourse and in forum theater no idea the people have the opportunity to discuss all their ideas and rehearse the possibilities the pros and cons of the ideas and finally it is also verified in the safety of the fictional space that is in theater as a theatrical practice we see here that forum theater not only empowers audiences, but also make them part of the action. This is how oppression can be put to an end by making the oppressors take the action and do it for themselves. And it also illustrates that alternatives and the choices are consulted, which can ultimately change the outcomes. I think uh, in the interest of time, I have touched upon uh, these points. Uh, to talk about the different kinds of theater that was experimented by him. So I have given a few examples. And from this, to conclude, uh, first, Boyle uses theater to make the oppressive situation and also the mechanism of domination visible. It is not hidden. He brings that to the light. Secondly, the performance itself is not enough because drama according to boyle is aimed to let people try to change the representation of their situation by involving themselves by acting on stage and then by implementing that action in real life whatever they have attempted to do in the fictional space thirdly he conceives theater as a method here method and praxis both go together so that people can perform by themselves using some of the techniques, even if they are not professional um, actors. The non-actors can also practice these techniques in group without needing the help of professional actors to act instead of them. People can act and think for themselves and they can bring about a change in their situation so that oppression can come to an end. At least the chain of oppression can be broken and then the cycle of life can be completed in a better manner with better working conditions and prosperity. So these are some of the elements which form the bedrock of the theater of the oppressed. These are the key ideas involved in it. I'm glad that I could communicate some of the key notions associated with the theater of the oppressed conceived by Augusto Boyle, which is ever expanding with different purposes. One such purpose is it is also becoming therapeutic as a psychodrama session. Uh, with this note, uh, let me come to an end. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so That's much, ma'am. Really, you have added a flavor by explaining about experimental and traditional theater and captivated the participants with a new perspective and you have proved yourself as the best teacher without missing the session. 
and sharing the knowledge. Uh, thank Bye. you so much, Chitra, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Really, your information was very crystal clear, and we have gained more knowledge, ma'am. Okay, I was perturbed because uh, there was no link. I didn't receive the link. Uh, it is good okay. that I received the link and I could share my ideas with the participants. I uh, hope it's well taken. Your words uh, prove that. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much ma for spending your valuable time with us. Yeah. May I take leave then? Or do I have yes, to wait? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma all right, ma'am. Thanks to yes, you and the Trust, Cape Comoran Trust. Wish you all the best for the success of this conference. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye to all of you for your patient listening. Please carry on with your. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I think the presenters are ready. May I know? Welcome, Dr. V. M. Saranya, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, sorry, ma'am. Sorry for the delay. Uh, thank you for your It's my pleasure, ma'am. No, Excuse me, ma'am. It's time for first of all, ma'am, lecture, ma'am. Kusum, ma'am, is very complete. Kushbu ma'am is in line, ma'am. Yes, Kushbu ma'am is waiting, ma'am. Uh, she is our second speaker. One second, one second. Ma'am, shall we have ma'am session after this uh, session? Ma'am, shall we start our uh, technical session? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kusum ma'am is waiting for uh, her lecture, ma'am. 1.30 to 2 p.m. Uh, is time. Is her time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'll ma'am, Kusum ma'am. Uh, yes, 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 uh, Dr. L. Mahalakshmi. Uh, I am able to hear you. Ma'am, uh, ma shall we have the session after the technical session or do you want to share uh, the knowledge now, ma'am? Uh, ma'am, can you kindly please tell me that how long it is going to take and when I have to present later? Ma'am, it will take one hour, ma'am. It will take one hour. 45 minutes to one hour, ma'am. Okay. So, can you do it now? Yes, ma'am. You want to do it, ma'am? Uh, yes, I, I can continue right now. I'm ready with this. Okay. Dear presenters ma and chairperson, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, shall we continue the technical session after ma'am's lecture, ma'am? Okay, ma'am. Okay. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry for the delay. No issues, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Dear presenters, we will have uh, one more half an hour more uh, to start the session. Now I request Dr. Kushum, Kushum Sajuma to share her knowledge, sharing ideas. Ma'am, Ma uh, we are very okay. much welcome for this wonderful international uh, knowledge forum on behalf of. Uh, our uh, AVP College Management and Department on Cape Comoran Trust and all the participants. I welcome you all. Uh, I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll just take a minute just to share my slide. Just a minute.
uh, is it visible can can you see my slide yes ma'am yes ma'am it's visible okay thank you so uh, good afternoon everyone present here and uh, i am really glad and grateful that i get this opportunity to share my views on this significant topic of this workshop that is subaltern studies and under the title of subaltern studies my subject today is cross cultural discourse so before directly going to cross cultural discourse i am going to share a small synopsis of what do we understand by subaltern studies so in post colonial theory subaltern is a term which very effectively explains the hierarchy of power relationships and legacy of cultures left by colonialism the term is coined by antonio gramsci which simply means of inferior rank so as many of the eminent thinkers they had been discussing that all those people who are pushed to margin for one reason or the other are subalterns they are of the inferior rank or they are suffering from that inferiority due to certain reasons the subaltern studies deal with the marginal societies that have suffered the pangs of colonialism the dilemma of constituting a cultural identity and reclaim it from the colonizer or from the hegemonic power groups so here it is really interesting to know that we cannot look at the contemporary world without looking at colonialism so here when i will be talking about cross cultural discourse i am taking the angle of colonial and post colonial because as it is it is already said that the uh, whole of the globe across the globe colonialism has shaped and reshaped history culture and identity of so many societies the theme of subaltern can be used to refer to someone who is disadvantaged underprivileged or has been denied the right to speak and it also alludes to the suppressed group of people from the lower socio economic strata particularly women who has been harassed for centuries for example i am taking uh, i am taking the example of rudali a short fiction written by mahashweta devi in context to women on the double margin how women are on the double margin because in patriarchal societies when they are dalit and women they are pushed to the double margin they are not addressed even the right to life marginal peripheral overlooked exploited disregarded and handled with unconcern and indifference are all terms that can be used to describe subaltern so all those groups all those individuals societies cultures who are related to these terms either marginal or peripheral or exploited so they may be called subaltern subaltern cultural studies so subaltern cultural studies analyze the interplay of binary relationship of dominance and subordination of us and other especially in colonial system so this was very much obvious under the rule of colonialism whole of the world was divided into two binary oppositions that was self and other everything which belonged to the self was superior and everything which belonged to the other was inferior and that is why when it comes to culture all those people who were the inhabitants of ex colonies or colonies at particular period of time 
they always remained marginal they never came to center it refers to the marginal groups excluded from the dominant power structures on the basis of social political economic and cultural differences cross cultural discourse in subaltern studies began with the process of reclaiming the cultural dignity and identity from the colonial mindset so the post colonial writing and post colonial narrative to much extent is the registration of resistance which people are showing towards the hegemonic superiority so before moving ahead let's define culture culture is a very complex phenomena every individual belongs to certain kind of rituals habits customs food habits clothing belief system and collectively we call it culture so how do we define culture i am quoting paul james here culture is defined as a social domain that emphasizes the practices discourses and material expressions which over time express the continuities and discontinuities of social meaning of life a life held in common so the people who share common culture uh, especially common rules of behavior and social organization can constitute a society and this is how one society segregates it from the other one particular group of people remain aloof from the another group of people only basis of these practices which these people are doing from time immemorial and they have defined it as culture so no doubt the historical forces shaped and reshaped the cultural formations but colonialism came as a sweeping force and washed away all the existing structures of the colonies it divided the communities as superior and inferior on the basis of culture and civilization the east has always been depicted as uncivilized and inferior by the west as the westerners had a poor understanding of the eastern culture so their understanding or we may call misunderstanding of the east ignited their ambition to rule over the region so stuart hall he remarks here i'm quoting cultural identities far from being eternally fixed in some essentialized past they are subject to the continuous play of history culture and power unquote so when we talk about cultural identities it is really important to understand that it is a process which keeps on happening and there are so many forces which work together to give it a contemporary shape we take any culture the contemporary scenario is the result of history or the continuity of past the outer circumstances have a, a deeper impact on cultures as well as on individuals so that is why uh, we need to look at colonialism as a shaping force of contemporary cultures and simultaneously individuals so colonial and post colonial colonial narrative the process of colonization has made an irreparable impact on world history the social and cultural fabric of the present world is dominantly shaped by colonialism as i have already talked about it over the period of time colonial elite developed a narrative of power power relationships they portrayed the colonizer as superior ruler and the colonized as inferior or the root and how it was filled in the psychology of the ruled that they are born to to be ruled as the european or the western forces always portrayed the narrative that they are born to rule colonial narrative justifies colonization and imperialism as natural process 
civilizing the primitive this was the major reason that they were moving to asian and african continents because they, they considered them as primitive savage wild uncivilized and their concern was to civilize them colonial writing declares indigenous people and cultures savage and primitive so this became the moral duty of the west to rule over the rest of the world post colonial writing is a stereotyped effort to counter the narrative created by the colonizer it majorly registers a strong resistance to the to the colonization and its devastating consequences then you you know sudden what happened when people when many of the countries suppose if we take example of india in last 75 years of independence the post colonial writing and writing writers they are making every effort to register the resistance against the narrative which is been created by the ruler the colonizer post colonialism is mainly concerned about the study of cultures formerly colonized societies struggling to detangle their identity and culture from the clutches of colonialism so this is what the post colonial writing is doing they are trying to free themselves and you know the work is not only to free themselves but it is also to redefine themselves they have lost their definition somewhere post colonial theory significantly draws attention towards cultural identity this is a process of relocating and reclaiming the lost roots the loss of traditional culture beliefs and values culture and subalternity so how do we relate both of them world history has divided culture in a binary relationship of hegemonic culture and subaltern culture culture of the self and other those cultures who are superior and ruling on all other primitive and uncivilized cultures it is about power and authority and has it one has it and one doesn't so as uh, we have seen in subaltern studies whether it is it is dalit literature or patriarchal societies we are talking about or we are talking about women uh, or women plight every everything is everything is about power one has it and another they do they do not have so the history and culture of the subaltern is represented and projected by the ruler or the master so i am uh, quoting here gayatri spivak questions quote can the subaltern speak unquote the subaltern cultures in colonial and post colonial societies are rejected and neglected as inferior their voices are not heard and when the voices are not heard they are not appreciated post colonial societies and cultures post colonial societies and cultures are impossible to be understood except the relationship to the history of imperialism and colonial rule so if today we are trying to understand post colonial cultures as i said that we need to go back revisit history revisit the process of colonization reassertion of native cultural identity remained the significant concern of post colonial societies so it is not only to redefine it redefine my culture but it is a process of relocating it and to reclaim it so they negotiate the two or multiple identity narratives the nations that experienced colonialism need to rewrite its legacy rooted in its persisting cultures they need to free themselves from the colonial power relations so it is an effort to decolonize the mind of post colonial societies and develop a post colonial identity 
based on cultural interactions between different identities. So in today's global world, we need to uh, rewrite all those written narratives which were about superiority and inferiority. And here, it is the time of cultural interactions where two or more culture, cultures or people from two or more cultures, they are getting the chance to interact and to celebrate the glory of their culture. So diasporic culture in post-colonial writing. So the people who are making the efforts to reclaim it. So the evening for lost motherland is the most overwhelming sentiment of the diasporic writing. In the beginning, when the migrations were forced and return was not possible, the evening was intense. So here we are talking about the old generation diasporic writing and diasporas. These migrants crossing the boundaries of time and space, making all the efforts to adapt with the new surroundings, but long to return to home one day. Consequently, they remain on margin and lose their identity as a peripheral man. So here we can take example of M.G. Vasanji's novel, The In-Between World of Vikram Lal, where Lal family, Vasanji has portrayed that how Lal family they are trying to preserve their identity by celebrating their festivals, by preparing Indian cuisines, and by cre recreating mini India in their small drawing rooms. So the quest for identity, nostalgia, rerouting, uprooting, and multicultural milieu has become the foremost concerns of diaspora. Old generation diasporic writing transfers the migrant experiences from one generation to another. So here our concern is not old generation diaspora because that time is over. Now they carry a perception of history that links them to the past whilst also carrying an insight into the future. So what these old generation diasporas, they have to offer to the coming generations. They are carrying the history with themselves and handing it over to the coming generations. Physical dislocation of people from their motherland create a number of social and cultural issues, but at the same time, it offers the wider perspectives of diasporic experiences. So as I am taking this, the presentation to cross-cultural discourse, how the preservation of small identities, of local identities, has taken the shape of globality. Diasporic fictions at the core try to unravel the complicated layers of cross-cultural confrontations through the experiences of people caught between two cultures of the East and the West. The past and present shuffle in search of concrete identity. So how this transition happened from old generation diaspora, from old generation post-colonial narrative to the cosmopolitan narrative, how this transition is happening and has happened. From quest of identity to the creation of identity is the narrative of transition. Because earlier, people were trying to search for their identity. Now, they are in the effort to create new identities for themselves. From displacement to replacement of is the new idea. Earlier, people had been struggling with displacement, uprooting, nostalgia, belongingness, longing, but now it is being replaced by replacement in the multicultural melting pots, where the previous generation struggled to maintain their identity, suppose their Indianness, the new generation is merging and trying to strike a harmonious balance 
between two or multiple identities. So this is how the transition has happened. Now the people who get migrated to different places for various reasons, no doubt that they get nostalgic at the loss of their home or homelands. But their efforts to assimilate in the new culture is appreciable. And as a result of that, now the quest of identity has become a creation of identity. The disruption of the binary opposition of local and global is the new strategy. It is a new strategic way to formulate a new world culture which is beyond the problematic relation of hegemony and subalternity. So now it is the world, global world, where people who are migrating from one place to another, going to host countries, they do not feel, go with inferiority. They, they do not feel that sense of loss. They claim their identity and they try to assimilate with the host. Now, Tao people encounter cultural crisis, but soon they explore new ways of belonging and becoming in new land. So this is the new process which is leading us to globality and what that is belonging and becoming. Further, how modern day diaspora is looking at cross-cultural discourse. Modern day diasporic writing offer representations of changed attitudes of family and social systems due to the immigration into the lands with different values and cultures. So there are people from different backgrounds, different value systems, and they experience two different nations and cultural identities but at the same time realize the necessity of globalization in life. So at present, when the world has become a global village, when people are migrating from one place to another, they are in the process of, become, of becoming a global citizen. So here I'm quoting Yasmin Hussain, quote, being in diaspora means living in a cross-cultural context in which change, fusion, and expansion are inevitable." Unquote. So this is really beautiful to understand that now when people are, uh, they come and encounter a, with different cultures and different identities, they try to fuse it. They try to expand their identity. They do not want to make it more complex and preserve it as their own. And that is the process which is inevitable. So there are few terms which are really important in context to cross-cultural discourse. So the term hybridity has been most recently associated with the works of Homi K. Bhava commonly refers to the creation of transcultural forms within the contact zone created by colonization. Bhava contends that all cultural statements and systems are constructed in a space that he calls the third space of enunciation. So he says when, the, when two people who belong to two different cultures, they come in contact with each other, this creates a third space. And this third space is the space of mutuality, where two people interact with each other and they try to merge and recreate new identity. And this is the third space of enunciation. In post-colonial discourse, hybridity has simply been used to express cross-cultural exchange. It is also an attempt to stress the mutuality of cultures and the process of assimilation and integration that is termed as acculturation. So when we've seen that when people migrate from 
suppose india or any other country to america so they try to eat their food to be like them to clothe themselves the way they clothe themselves to uh, just accustom themselves in their customs to practice what those people are practicing they are trying to adopt the mainstream and that is the effort which we call acculturation so acculturation when the immigrant population adopt the mainstream food customs traditions clothing and fashion they try to become american and this is the process that is called acculturation so now a step forward from acculturation is transculturation which is happening right now in the contemporary world transculturation is a term coined by cuban anthropologist fernando ortiz in 1947 to describe the phenomena of merging and converging cultures on the other hand it also refers to the encounters between or among cultures in which each one acquires and adapts elements of others and changes in one culture by the introductions of elements from another so this is the process of transculturation and how it is different from acculturation so in acculturation maybe you leave behind your practices and you adopt the other one but in transculturation two cultures come in contact with each other and maybe they merge they fuse and they expand with some new identity and that is transculturation in today's global world of cultural interactions the binaries of self and other of center and margin of superiority and inferiority are dismantling the world seems to be growing in new possibilities for example people from different countries and from different cultural backgrounds tend to create all together a new culture which is neither of the majority nor of the marginal minorities and that is the beauty of these processes because in today's world when the people are doing businesses and communications are happening global and people are have to interact even from one country to another from one community to another so these processes which are leading us to globalization become very significant cross cultural discourse when we define cross cultural discourse or literature we are talking about comparing uh, one or one culture's world view to another culture's world view writers who belong to more than one culture are able to explore the possibilities of multiple cultural identities so i'm quoting here according to stuart hall there are at least two different ways of thinking about cultural identity one is the terms of shared culture and second of what we are we are means where we are already rooted and later on when we start sharing our cultures so this insight explains the cross cultural narratives that represent the struggle of balancing the home and the host and further transcending the disparities of culture so this transcend the this process of transcending it is it makes the uh, cross cultural discourse happen further this represents a new way of looking at history and culture not focused on subordination or inferiority but on shared equal and global identity the term is used to describe discourses involving cultural interactivity here when you belong to a certain country or place or community or culture when you interact with the another culture it is not with any binary it is not with any opposition it is interaction in Inter that healthy interaction where you glorify your culture you celebrate your culture equally writers portray their characters making efforts to amalgamate the food habits clothing lifestyle and much more which symbolizes a diasporic assimilation of two or more cultures 
as Amrati Sen opines here, quote, modern Indians see themselves as global citizens. And they aspire to make use of the best of both worlds, while they retain a sense of affiliation and companionship with India and Indians, they find no contradictions in being loyal citizens of country they have emigrated." Unquote. So this is how to make best of both worlds. The place where your roots are and the place where you are moved to. So now I am concluding this. Cross-cultural discourse is an effort to create a parallel worldview of different cultures across the globe. There is also an effort to reclaim one's cultural dignity without being inferior or superior. Subaltern so cultural voices loudly registers resistance to the elite voices of hegemony and negate subjugation. So the the platform which has been provided by cross-cultural discourse has enabled the post-colonial narrative to raise their voice and to put forward their narrative as it is. The post-colonial writing creates a space for the subaltern to speak, to look at the word history and culture from their perspective. Because as suppose if we had been the inhabitants of the ex colonies, it does not mean that we are the subject to history. We have a voice and we have the capacity to loud our voices and to express ourselves from my station, from our places. And the elite intellectuals do not and cannot represent their stance. So it is not possible. If the Westerners are going to propagate and portray us in their narrative, Maybe that is the faulty one. The elite intellectuals do not and cannot. So without any imposed boundaries, today's world is a global village. And that is what cross-cultural discourse is. Globalization is a continuous process of socio-cultural change. So this presentation makes a point that today's post-colonial literature is a reflection of cultural changes and adaptations. It is also a representation of ethics, social, political, and economic advancements in the world. Cross-cultural discourse helps us to transcend cultural barriers, build cultural bridges, and appreciate cultural differences. We cannot deny the fact that history matters a great deal in constructing contemporary realities. But today, we live on an interrelated world, and coexistence is the only way. So that's all uh, with this presentation. And uh, I would like to extend my thanks to this prestigious platform of Cape Comorin Trust. And my special thanks to dear Dr. Shalja Vasudeva, ma'am, to offer me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this eminent platform. Thank you so very much. And to all the thank listeners. You so, well. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Kusham Shanchu, ma'am. Really last but not least, actually, you are the last speaker of the plenary session. And you have uh, proved your eminence through your uh, clear presentation on post-colonial literature and uh, amalgamation, amalgamation of culture. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.